American Experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The Foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Liberty Mutual Insurance is a proud supporter of the American Experience. And by helping people live safer, more secure lives, we are also proud supporters of the American Dream. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. Major funding for Chicago City of the Century provided by the Rauner Family Foundation, supporting the education and well-being of children in Chicago. And by the state of Illinois, discover, indulge, explore, play, right here, right now in Illinois. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. By the time of the Civil War, after less than 30 years of unbridled capitalism, Chicago was the metropolis of the Midwest. The world's largest railroad hub, the world's largest lumber market, the world's largest grain port, stacker of wheat, poet Carl Sandburg called it, and hog butcher to the world. Built with timber from Wisconsin forests, Chicago burned in 1871 like a giant forest fire, the largest urban conflagration of the age. A city of braggers and boasters, it boasted once more. People would swarm to the jobs along Chicago's stinking river. From the east and from the Elbe, Rhine, Danube, and Vistula. The Protestant elite who hired them was hostile to their foreign ways, their labor unions, their socialism, especially the anarchists among them. They told capitalists, your function in life is to die. We're going to get you. We're going to bomb your factories. We're going to tear apart your system. The general strike is going to bring down capitalism. You'll be shot afterwards. The great battle of post-Civil War America was between capital and labor. Chicago would be its cauldron. The Chicago Fire of 1871 was one of the great urban catastrophes of modern times. Papers would boast that the great London Fire of 1666 or Napoleon's siege of Moscow in 1812 hadn't done half the damage. Chicago, its boosters believed, had to be first in everything. But railroads still converged on the city. The stockyards and hundreds of mills, factories, and warehouses that ringed the downtown had survived. Editor Joseph Medill cranked out an edition of the Tribune while the ground was still hot. Chicago boomers and boosters are on trains the next day going out to the East Coast saying, hey, this is a great place to invest. We're not broke, we just had a little fire. An inquiry at the time determined that one suspect, Catherine O'Leary, was not responsible. 
that she was in bed when the fire started, not in the barn with her cow. But within weeks, she was depicted as the culprit, not 38 years old, but an old hag. A published photo showed another woman with a steer, not a cow. I've seen a few where she actually looks like a witch. You know, they've got the big nose with the, you know, the, um, the wart on her nose, and um, she actually looks evil in some of them. She was a Catholic, she was, she was an immigrant, she was poor, and most of all, she was a woman. She was the perfect patsy for the fire. In truth, she was a very decent, honorable, hardworking lady who was trying to raise her family in very difficult circumstances. They didn't want to lose their investors, and so it was easy to, I think, find a scapegoat and say, oh, well, we know the reason the fire started. And you know, these Irish were not clean. They were throwing their garbage out. This was just all made up. And most of them are burned out, too. They did say that they've moved out of the city. The slums are going to be cleaned up. We don't have to worry about them anymore. It was really a terrible thing for her to have to endure. She just died, I think, heartbroken. One dark night when we were all in bed, Mrs. O'Leary put a lantern in the Mrs. O'Leary and her cow became one of America's most enduring legends. A hot time in the old town tonight. Fire, fire. Chicago sends its fireman's band, a rose parade favorite. They came along to prevent the city of Chicago from reenacting the incident of Mrs. O'Leary's cow. This float won the coveted national trophy. In 1997, after 126 years, the Chicago City Council investigated the fire and formally absolved Mrs. O'Leary of responsibility. And the true villain in this case was Peg Leg O'Sullivan, who broke into the O'Leary barn to steal milk from one of her cows to mix up a batch of whiskey punch, which uh, was fueling a local uh, gathering of some of the uh, lads down the street from the O'Leary home. The rubble was swept into Lake Michigan to create more real estate. Chicago began to rebuild. Marshall Field dreamed of a new store on State Street as he removed hay and dung from a brick barn and set up display counters. Potter Palmer would replace his grand hotel, the Palmer House, with millions in loans secured only by his good reputation. Cyrus McCormick, the Reaper King, vowed to rebuild his plant on a vaster scale. Anthony Trollope, an Englishman, visited Chicago. He said, these businessmen in Chicago are reckless and they fail a lot. But failure doesn't bother them. Um, catastrophe doesn't bother them. They bounce right back. And, and that seems to be ingrained in the character of the city. The fire happens, and believe it or not, in the newspapers, it's seen as an opportunity. Chicago hops right to it after the fire and rebuilds itself in an astonishingly short period of time. It's about a two-year period. We didn't have a mythological past, so we're building one in 1871. To some degree, it's the city grows so quickly, and then it's creating a past and thinking about a past, and the fire provides a mythology. Chicago's gonna rise out of the ashes, uh, does arise out of the ashes. How much of the city is actually burned? Well, you know, only a small part of the actual city is burned, but that's not the way we think about the fire. There was an outpouring of aid from around the nation and from 25 foreign countries. England sent 8,000 books. And even Queen Victoria personally donated books and inscribed them to the people of Chicago. And they had assumed, of course, that in the Great Fire, Chicago would have lost its uh, library. Well, there was only one problem. Chicago didn't have a library. Two years after the fire, a 17-year-old came to Chicago from Boston 
with dreams of becoming an architect. Though he found the buildings unimpressive, he was impressed with the recovery. Young Lewis Henry Sullivan, who had dropped out of MIT after a year, got, he said, a sense of big things to be done. He wrote in his autobiography about stepping off the train, seeing the city before him, part of it still in ruins from the fire, and thrusting his hand up in the air and saying, this is the place for me. The city shouted itself hoarse, Sullivan would write. We are the crudest, rawest, most savagely ambitious dreamers and doers in the world. He would be one of them. Gustavus Swift would be another. Swift got his start as a teenage butcher on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. The story my father likes to tell is that when Gustavus Swift was about 16 years old, he borrowed $20 from his father to buy a heifer. And then he uh, slaughtered the heifer and went and sold it to local residents in the Cape and came back and uh, his father asked him, how did you do? He said, well, I sold the meat for $20. And his father said, well, you didn't make any money at it then. He said, well, yes, I did. I, I sold the hide for $2. And the reason I like that story is that eventually he, he discovered that in the big picture that in the livestock business, you didn't make money or much money selling the meat, but you made it in the byproducts. Swift became a cattle dealer who followed the market west. In 1875, he moved his pregnant wife, Anne, and five children into a rented house near the Union stockyards. He was so frugal, for 30 years he would not allow her to buy curtains until she threatened to leave. Even then, not for his bedroom. Swift wanted to be closer to the source of cattle. The source was nowhere near Chicago. It was more than a 1,000 miles away in Texas. Later, it spread north, across the Great Plains to Montana. After the railroad reached Abilene, Kansas in 1867, cowboys began herding Texas longhorns north along the Chisholm Trail to the railhead. They were loaded on cattle cars bound for buyers in Chicago like Gustavus Swift. Swift would revolutionize the beef industry, what Americans and much of the world ate, when they ate it, where they bought it, how little they paid for it. Once a luxury, he made beef affordable and commonplace. He bought his cattle at the Union stockyards and shipped them east to butchers he knew in Massachusetts. But there were problems shipping live animals. They have to be fed, they have to be watered, which they don't do very happily in a railroad car, which means that they're constantly losing weight. And many of these are animals with long horns, stuffed into cattle cars and gouging each other so that a number of them will arrive wounded or dead by the time they reach their final destination. These are all reasons not to want to ship live animals. Gustavo Swift was shipping via the railroad steers that weighed about 1,000 pounds. He only was able to sell 600 pounds of that animal through the meat. And so there was 400 pounds that was just costing him money. Swift decided to slaughter the cattle in Chicago and ship only the dressed beef east. In that decision, he took risks greater than any Chicago entrepreneur had ever taken. If you're not going to ship live animals, how are you going to ship the beef so that it doesn't rot along the way? And there, the answer to the riddle has already been provided by the pork packers in the 1850s. This immense network of ice storing places that cut ice in the winter from Indiana to Wisconsin, delivered it to Chicago. If you could simply get that ice into railroad cars, insulate those cars, and then send a jet of cold air across whatever the contents of the railroad car would be, you could ship any meat anywhere in the country without it rotting. Ice loaded in Chicago would not last to New York. This forced Swift into the ice business, 
He created five depots along the tracks. Every ton of dressed beef needed a ton of ice at each of his five depots. The railroads he used for livestock had invested in cattle cars and charged by the pound. When Swift bought his own refrigerated cars, the railroads conspired against him. He retaliated by dropping their more direct route to New York that ran south of Lake Erie. Instead, he shipped through Canada to Montreal and then south to Boston and New York, arranging for ice along the way. For dressed beef, the longer trip didn't matter. Transportation was only the first challenge. Americans were used to eating their beef fresh. They were used to pork being in a packed form, whether it was ham or bacon or salt pork or what have you. But the way they'd had beef up until this time was by going down to their local butcher, who had slaughtered that cow the night before. And so the meat was still just within 24 hours of having been a living, pulsing animal. And Swift was asking them to buy a beef that was at least a week old, which did not sound like healthy beef to most Americans. New York butchers, Boston butchers, Philadelphia butchers don't want to carry this meat. They're, in fact, they're giving it a bad rap. They're calling it embalmed meat. Uh, and they're really afraid of being put out of business. Butchers in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, told Swift they would not sell Swift-dressed beef if all Fitchburg were starving. All right, Swift replied, I'll feed Fitchburg myself. His response to a boycott by butchers in Lowell was the same. The old man gets on a train, goes east, goes to Lowell, sets up a railroad siding, unloads a whole hell of a load of lumber, builds a butcher shop, hires a workforce, and drives a number of the local butchers out of business. It is all right to lose money, Swift told his agents. Just don't let them nose you out. He hired many of the bankrupt butchers as distributors of Swift beef. His huge volume ensured low prices. Competition from other Chicago packers like Philip Armour forced prices lower still. So low that Swift and his competitors sold their meat at a loss. In 1889, it cost $48 to purchase a steer in Chicago, dress the meat, and ship it to New York. It sold there for $38. the Chicago Packers earned their profits on the margin from what local butchers threw away. Things that the local butcher had had to give away because there just wasn't enough of them and there weren't enough, enough customers for them to sell could now be gathered into one location and turned into tons and tons of that material. You could hire scientists to figure out how to turn that material into soap or buttons or new forms of meat that had never been sold before. Hides were tanned to leather. Hair stuffed cushions. Horns became combs. Guts, tennis racket strings. Tails, paintbrushes. Hooves, jello. Nothing was wasted. Gustavus Swift would walk out to Bubbly Creek, which was this terrible little sewer that ran out of one of his plants, with his top hat, his dark suit. He'd have his pants tucked into his Wellington boots, and he would wade into Bubbly Creek to check what was coming out of the sewer. And if he saw any grease or fat, uh, then he knew that was, that was waste, because you could have turned that into lard. And uh, he'd go back and he'd find the source of, of how that happened and correct it. He was a very hands-on manager. You can't understand industrial capitalism without understanding the importance of the pennies, half cents, a tenth of a cent, a hundredth of a cent. And when you think about millions of pounds of beef being processed through a single plant in a year, you begin to understand 
why a hundredth of a cent was something that kept Swift and Armour and other uh, industrialists up at night. There were two ways packers could cut costs, speed up the process and slash wages. They did both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 